this is uh, day number four of uh, ten days of prayer. I want to say thank you to the organizers, to the group of elders and uh, brothers and sisters speakers that will be presenting uh, for the rest of the 10 days of prayer, their messages from the Lord. We already had uh, three messages delivered, beautiful, encouraging, and uh, uplifting messages. Thank you so much. This Sabbath is uh, special because we have uh, this morning service, but there will be also a prayer meeting in the evening, so uh, don't forget to come out again tonight. I think uh, the starting hour is the same, right? Seven, seven o'clock. So seven o'clock tonight, please come back and uh, let's pray together. This Sabbath, I'm wrapping up the book of uh, Ephesians. The book of Ephesians, and uh, this is going to be the 20th presentation from this book. I can tell you I have learned a lot because uh, I've discovered in the book of Ephesians things I never knew were there, even things I never knew were in the Bible. And you may think, well, pastor, you have not read the Bible. That's not the point. The point is, no matter how many times you have read the Bible, you will always have the chance to stumble upon things that you've never seen before. And when you see them, you, you are like, huh, is that really there? And in some moments, you will have the impression, no, they are not. In some other moments, you will have uh, the conviction, yes, those things are there, and they are there for me. Waging peace in a raging war. That's the title for this final section, final segment of the book of Ephesians. Waging peace in a raging war. I was a freshman in high school, <clears throat> and I was uh, in uh, the best and the worst high school in my county. It was the best academically. It was also the worst because of uh, bullying and gangs. And uh, in that class, there was a guy, his name was David. David and I were very different. David was a city boy, I was a country boy. And uh, David was a very strong, well-built, robust guy, very self-confident, very self-reliant. I was uh, tiny, skinny, and shy. Somewhat easy to get in trouble, too. So uh, David would uh, often stand up for me and protect me because we had something in common. We were a religious minority in that class. The majority of my classmates were Eastern Orthodox background. David was Pentecostal. His parents were Pentecostal. And I was coming from a Seventh-day Adventist background. And we were often bullied by the majority because of the oddness of our religion. So he would, he would stand up for me. He would protect me. But one day he got in trouble with one of the gangs. They hit him and they threatened him. Uh, they will beat him up like he was never beaten before. So he came to me, because uh, now we were friends, and, and told me, Joe, uh, uh, I'm in trouble. 
these uh, stupid guys want to beat me up. I need you to help me. Help you how? I need you to come with me to speak with Goliath. Goliath, I said, yes, he said. I have a friend. We have to go up the hill and then down the valley, and he's there. He's a shepherd. He's a big guy. You've never seen something like that before. Huge muscles. And more than that, he has a huge bludgeon or a club. Now, uh, I have this just as, as an illustration, okay? This is something similar, but you, you can imagine something much longer, okay? And with a club much bigger than this one. That is a, sort of a st staff that uh, shepherds use, but uh, those are used as a weapon. I mean, if, if your head encounters that uh, big part of uh, a shepherd's uh, bludgeon, I feel very sorry for that encounter. So, off we go, up the hill, and then uh, down uh, into the valley. And from far, we could spot some sheep there, because he was a shepherd, after all. And uh, after a certain while, we could see him too. He was standing next to his uh, flock, like this, leaning on his uh, club. He really was big, I'm telling you. I've, I, I had never seen anybody that big before. Young man, strong man. So we went closer. I didn't even dare to walk up to him. David uh, was very courageous. He went to him. They were friends, allegedly. And uh, he had a conversation with uh, Goliath. I was trying to remember his real name. I don't know his real name, but that's what he told me. He is like Goliath. And uh, he, he spoke with uh, him, then uh, turned around, came toward me and said, let's go. So we left. Now, as we were leaving, I'm asking him, so, so uh, David, what did he say? Is he going to come and uh, deal with them? Because that's why we were there. He was going to get Goliath with the bludgeon and deal with those stupid gangsters. And uh, I'm asking him, so did he say yes? Is he going to come? And he said, no. No? Why not? He said, well, the thing is, uh, he's friends with some of those guys as well. So uh, now he wants me to befriend them and be in the same gang. And then in a few minutes, we had to part ways because he had to go home this way and I had to go home that way. And uh, on my way home, this was a rainy day, worse than, than uh, you can see now. And uh, you could not walk. You would, you would slide in the mud, you know. This was out in the orchard. So you would slide and I was, my shoes, my clothes, a mess. But I had more than an hour to get home, walking home, so I had, I had time, plenty of time to think. And uh, all I was thinking about was that, that bludgeon, that club. And I was thinking, man, see, these two religious minority guys that go to find a Goliath, and ask him, as if borrowing his uh, bludgeon or, or hiring his bludgeon to uh, beat up some folks that turn out to be on the same side of reality. And uh, I know I was very disturbed in my heart and mind of uh, why I was really there. When I think back today, 
same episode still disturbs me. Because somehow I see myself or selves reflected in this story. We are supposed to wage peace in a raging war. And quite often, we try to wage that peace hiring or renting, borrowing the bludgeon or the club of the enemy. Ephesians chapter 6, we are going to read some of the verses that we read last time. We are going to start with uh, verse 13, and then we are going to continue reading. Let's pray. Lord, the message you've given me was disturbing to me. It may be disturbing to others as well. But I pray that your spirit will guide my heart and mind and my mouth. And uh, the same spirit will touch each heart and uh, each one of us will get the message coming from you in Jesus' name. Amen. Therefore, says the Apostle Paul, after he had told us that we are not wrestling against flesh and blood, therefore, take up, he says, the whole armor of God. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And you may think the evil day is somewhere out there, somewhere in the future. There will be an evil day, and we are doing preparation for that evil day. Well, the evil day can be today or tomorrow or any day. And Paul says, take up, plural, you, you, each one of us. It's not only individual. This is a community kind of experience, a congregational kind of story. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. Withstand whom in the evil day? Well, withstand those that are not flesh and blood, because our wrestling is not against flesh and blood. Withstand in the evil day and having done or having accomplished all to stand, to stand. That's a very, very important aspect of our spiritual reality to be standing. To be standing in the sense of uprightness, in the sense of uh, being firm in your standing. And then the apostle goes on, continues explaining how this can happen how you can withstand and how you can stand. Stand, therefore, he says, having girded your waist with truth. Gird your waist with truth. And as you know, if you want to be able to stand, to be strong, it is this area that you need to gird because that's where you develop, that's where, where you unfold strength. Stand having girded your ways with truth. If one of uh, our uh, little girls or boys would like to help me, all right, we already have a volunteer. Good job. Thank you so much, Jason, right? Yeah, Jason. Wonderful. <laughs> You're my buddy, okay? Put on the truth. Excellent. This fits you, man. Oh, my. Put on the truth. Now, mind you, the truth is not the weapon. No, no. We are somehow inclined to use the truth as the weapon. 
Are you understanding me? The truth is not the weapon. The truth is the gird. What's that? It's a sash. It's if you want a belt. Gird your waist with truth. Because truth will help you stand. And the next piece you put on is the breastplate of righteousness or correctness of righteous action. The breastplate of righteousness protects you. It protects your heart, your internal organs, all the sensitive parts of your reality. It's a breastplate of righteousness. Again, please be mindful of the fact that righteousness is not the weapon. We are inclined to use righteousness, even self-righteousness, as a weapon. But that's not the, the, the weapon. It goes on and says, and having shod your feet, your feet with the preparation or the readiness of the gospel of uh, peace. And uh, I'm not very positive about this, but many have suggested that this is something, uh, it's like a shin protect kind of thing that you put on so they cannot take you off your feet. Because in a combat situation, you want to be standing firmly. You don't want to be taken off your feet. But there's a certain reason why the Apostle Paul says that you should have this readiness. Why should you have this readiness at the level of your feet? Please look at the text. Having shod your feet with the preparation or readiness of the gospel of what? Of peace. We are waging peace in a raging war. And this Bible verse reminds us of a very well-known text from the Old Testament. The Apostle Paul threw out this description of the armor of God. The full armor of God quotes Old Testament, actually. But this is the text he actually hints upon. Isaiah 52, 7, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of Him who brings good news, who proclaims what? Shalom. Peace. Who brings glad tidings of good things. Who proclaims salvation. Who says to Zion, your God reigns. Please look in that Bible verse and see how many good, positive, great things the one that ha has the strong feet, the beautiful feet, how many good things he brings. And then Paul goes on and says, put on, above all, the shield of faith or faithfulness, because biblically faith and faithfulness is the same exact concept. The shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Again, please notice, this is still not the weapon. This is still for protection. You put on this shield of faithfulness, not as a weapon, but as a protection. It's not for attack. It's not to use it, your faith, your faithfulness, to attack anybody. It's to protect yourself, to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. And then comes, then comes verse 17, 
the helmet, can you see anything? No. It's the helmet of salvation. It protects your mind. Why? Because metanoia, what is metanoia? Metanoia is repentance. It is transformation of the mind, changing your mind. It happens here at the level of the mind. You need the helmet of salvation. To, but the helmet is not the weapon. It's for protection. And now comes this piece, the final one, and the sword, please move it back, and the sword of the Spirit. The sword of the Spirit. Okay? So this is the full armor. You have everything on. Well, you will, you will have to work on it a little bit, but I want to tell you that this is all yours, okay? And uh, I will need to borrow this from you for the sermon, and then I will give it back to you, okay? Okay, please give him a big hand. All right. Thank you. You can go and sit down. So, so this, is, this is the only piece of weapon which is the sword of spirit, the Word of God, the Word of God which is the same actually as the gospel of peace that was mentioned earlier in verse 15. When, when you realize what kind of war this is, that the only way to engage your enemy is the sword, then you can be disturbed and ask yourself, and, and that's where my disturbance was, what are we doing? What am I doing? Am I fighting in this war with the right weapon, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God? Or I have developed all kind of other weapons. And at times I even go to Goliath down to the valley somewhere and borrow a club from him because I feel much safer if I have a club, a bludgeon in my hands. The word, the sword of the Spirit how am I going to fight with that? And you know, when, when we speak about the Word of God, there are two aspects. One aspect is this, the written Word. But also what John chapter 1 verse 14 says, that the Word became flesh, John 1 14, the Logos became flesh and dwelt or pitched His tent among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Two aspects. And those two aspects, grace and truth, combined are the sword of the Spirit. They have to be combined because as you heard it before, truth in itself is not the weapon. Grace and truth combined, that is the weapon. If you only use grace, you have no weapon. That's the fact. Yes, you may get something that looks like peace. That's not peace either. But it's only grace. If it's only grace, there is no war. You are not waging peace. If it's only truth, it's not the sword of the Spirit, because truth can be taken over by the enemy and use it as a club or a bludgeon. And when this hits with the truth, I'm telling you, somebody can die. 
The sword, according to this, is grace and truth combined. You may, may know this name, George Knight. He used to be a church historian at uh, Andrews University. He's retired now. In 2008, he wrote a book, The Apocalyptic Vision and the Neutering of Adventism. Now, he's using the nice word, the neutering. Do you know what that stands for? Neutering means castration. But how can you put that word on a cover page, right? So he's using this neutering in connection to the apocalyptic vision of Adventism. And this is what he says. There are two extremes, two ways of neutering ourselves, our mission, or our combat, if you want, our waging war in a raging, waging peace in a raging war. There are two ways. One of those ways, he says, is the beastly preaching. And what he calls beastly preaching is a way of preaching in which the focus is on the beast and not on the lamb. A way of preaching in which the apocalyptic army of Jesus Christ, because in the book of Revelation you have the picture of the church as an apocalyptic army where everybody has the full armor of God on, but in that picture, what is important to notice is that the Lamb is the one that leads them. We cannot forget that the commander of the army is the Lamb himself. We cannot forget that uh, when the white horse goes out in chapter 6, and you know in chapter 6 in the book of Revelation, there's a white horse going out, and then there's a red horse, and there's a black horse, and a pale horse, four horses, and only one horse comes back at the end. Which one? The white. And the one sitting on that white horse is who? Jesus Christ Himself, and His name is what? His name is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, but He has one more name there. Anybody remembers what name that is? No? What is the name? Look it up. His name is the Word of God. The Word of God. Yes, we know the three angels are flying, but we cannot fly them with bludgeons. We have to have them fly with the gospel. Because if you look in uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 6, this is how it starts, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel. The everlasting gospel is to be preached, and all three angels are flying with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, combination of grace and truth, which is the everlasting gospel to preach to the whole, to, to who dwell, those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. This is very important because any kind of picture of the three angels flying in which the three angels have each one of them clubs to hit humanity is not the right picture of the gospel, of the sword of God. No, they are flying with the gospel, and yes, they are flying in the context of a war. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 reveals that the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest, with the remnant of uh, the woman's offspring. And those are those that keep 
the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, if you want, as an application here, the commandments of God can be the truth, the testimony of Jesus Christ can be the grace. I know you can interpret that differently as well, but just for the sake of the imagery, get those things together there. Yes, it is the enemy that rages against us. But the three angels fly with the everlasting gospel, which is the gospel of peace, which is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, grace and truth. Any picture in which the preaching of the gospel and we believe strongly that it is our mission, it is our call to preach the everlasting gospel in this last generation. Any picture that portrays this preaching of the gospel as somebody swinging clubs around, maybe somebody will be hit, is not the right picture. And that neuters our mission one extreme. Then, because I believe the enemy enjoys taking you from one, titch, uh, one ditch and throwing you into another ditch, you have the other way of neutering our mission, which is political correctness. Political correctness means there is no truth, there is no truth, there is only grace, as opposed to there is no grace, there is only truth. I'm going with the bludgeon of the truth, no grace, and this is the other extreme, there is no weapon. I drop everything, it's all grace, for the fee, uh, sake of peace, I smile to everybody, I don't say anything, I may know the truth, keep it for yourself, keep it to yourself, don't say it, don't disturb anybody, peace. The problem with that is, that that is a false sense of safety and security. And uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3 says, For when they say peace and safety, they, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. It's a false sense of security, of, of safety. When you just... Smile to everybody, and you are gracious to everybody, and there is no truth attached to grace. Yes, grace goes to everybody. God's saving grace was shown to everybody. But then grace starts teaching everybody something, and that's where truth comes in. And I cannot neuter my mission, dropping truth altogether for the sake of Peace, because this is not peace, this is danger. It is something that masquerades at, as peace. And um, if you want to know what peace is, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And that is peace. That is peace, the shalom that is in Jesus Christ, that is in God. Now, this is the context, because I was supposed to preach about prayer, right? This is the context in which Paul speaks about prayer. When I first saw that prayer in the form of prayer and supplication is in Ephesians, I was happy and I said, man, you can preach about prayer, and then when I started looking at what Paul says, I said, yeah, it is prayer. But this prayer is in a certain context. And it would be not faithful to the text to just generalize about, brothers and sisters, let's pray, let's supplicate God, and it's so good, God is good, God gives. No, no, no. This is a war zone here. And we are waging peace in a war zone in a raging war. And Paul continues in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, he says, praying always. That word always in uh, the Greek is every season or time, 
every opportunity, every occasion. You can infer from that that, yes, even the 10 days of prayer should be an occasion, an opportunity, a season, praying, praying. With all prayer and supplication, he says. Prayer and supplication, very important, in the Spirit. Why does he say in the Spirit? Because the description of the armor of God and the warfare in this chapter is a spiritual armor and a spiritual kind of warfare. And we can pray in the Spirit or we can pray without or outside of the Spirit. When somebody prays in the Spirit, he and or she receives the sword of whom? Of the Spirit. When somebody prays outside of the Spirit, then the devil takes the prayer session over and it becomes a sort of a, of a how, how do they call them uh, when, when they say nice things and encouraging things? What kind of speech is that? What is motivational? Yes, it's, it's like a motivational good job. Yeah, motivational speech or mo motivational session done by the devil, after which you get a club, go out and boom, boom, boom. That's, that's the reality. If, if I pray in the Spirit, then it's going to be the Spirit that gives me the sword, the Word of God to go out and wage peace in a raging world. War. That picture changes the whole reality of prayer. Prayer in the Spirit. There are all kinds of people that pray for all kinds of things. I've heard about people that prayed before going to, to, to steal something. They, they stole a car, and, and uh, this was a real story. The mom said, I don't know what happened because they prayed that they will not get caught. Yeah, you, you can, somebody can pray when, when he or she goes to the, the lover so that the spouse will not find it out. There's all kinds of ways of praying. But Paul says, pray always, or in every season, time, opportunity, occasion, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. In the Spirit. Prayer and supplication? Is there prayer and then there is supplication? Is prayer and supplication the same thing or two different realities? What is prayer and what is supplication? If prayer was the same as supplication, then we would have with all prayer and prayer. But it's different. Prayer and supplication. In Old Testament and New Testament language, prayer, the word that is translated usually with prayer, is tefillah. Tefillah. It's a noun that comes from the verb palal in Hebrew. Please follow this. Palal in Hebrew, which means to judge, that is, to think or to reason in the sense of sorting something out so, so you can judge the value of one or the other. And you may think, okay, so how does this then relate to prayer? How is prayer an act of uh, judgment? Because the, the reflexive of that verb, palal, to judge, can also mean judge yourself. Well, this is what it means. When somebody comes to God in palal or in that kind of prayer, the, the tefillah kind of prayer that is indicated here, prayer and supplication, it is you sitting in God's presence, speaking to God, God speaking to you, and sorting out who you are, judging, so to speak, who you are, 
what you are supposed to do, what your role, what your mission in this world is. If in uh, Isaiah chapter 50 verse 4, this is what it says, the Lord God has given me the tongue of disciple that I may know how to sustain the weary one with a word. Tongue and word. Please keep that in mind. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen as a disciple. That is the tefillah kind of prayer in which God awakens you in the morning and you speak to Him and He speaks to you. And you may not notice here, but this is actually a messianic prophecy, which means that it speaks about Jesus Himself. And if you read in the Gospels, you will see that Jesus Himself, when was He having the tefillah with the Father? Early in the morning. Yes, because God can wake you up. He can wake you up in a natural way, like everybody wakes up in the morning, but He can even wake you up supernaturally. He, he has done that several times to me, and uh, I've heard other stories as well, because, you know, not everybody's an early bird. The saying says that early bird gets the what? The worm. That's a bad saying. But the point is not everybody has the ability to get up early in the morning. And, and some of you may be struggling with this, say, Lord, I want to get up in the morning, but I can't. I, I fall asleep. I, I, I wake up and then, uh, whoop, and I'm gone. But I heard stories where God literally, when they prayed and said, Lord, you wake me up if you want to have that encounter with me. Uh, my my, my mother-in-law tells me that uh, uh, she had uh, the Lord wake her up literally calling her by name. Now, you may doubt that God speaks to mother-in-laws, but it can happen. <laughs> but the, the, the weirdest story I've ever heard is, you probably know some of you the name Ron Cluzet. Ron Cluzet? It's a pretty, pretty famous uh, preacher. And uh, he was an early bird. His wife was not. So she was frustrated why she can't get up in the morning and he said, hey, pray, Lisa, pray, pray, and the Lord will wake you up. And she prayed. And in the morning, the phone rings. You know, the, the, the wire phone. She picks it up, and she says, the sweetest voice told her, Lisa, I'm here for you. And then, beep, beep, beep. And that was it. So she was awake. Wow, that's beautiful. But it's, it gets even better. Because later than they, that day, they say, Lisa discovered that the phone was unplugged. Because in the evening, the husband unplugged it so that nobody would disturb them in the morning. So who spoke on the phone? Well, you may th say, this is too much. <laughs> Listen! Try it out. Try it out and then come and speak. The point is, Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 says, Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18, Come now, says God, let us reason together. If your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. If they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Please notice that in both cases, the color is red. And red is a symbol of blood shed. It's like somebody that has used the club, hitting people all around. God says, hey, I need you to cool down. Let's reason together. And if, if that's how, how your sins are, scarlet, or crimson, I can make you white. I can cleanse you. And that's the tefillah prayer. 
And yes, prayer and supplication. Because supplication means what? To ask for something, to supplicate, to, to petition something, right? You are there begging maybe God to give you something. But let me ask you, after you had tefillah, will your supplication stay the same or it will change? In other words, after you prayed the tefillah kind of prayer, you, you had that encounter with God and God established who you are. God established what the armor is. God established what kind of warfare you are fighting. God established what the weapon is, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Are you going to have the same kind of petitions, the same kind of give me thanks? No. Because then everything you petition for goes in line with your mission. And your mission is to wage peace in a raging war. And the Apostle Paul goes on saying, being watchful to this end, to what end? To the end of standing and to the end of withstanding the enemy with all perseverance and supplication or petition or request for all the saints. Because as we spoke about it before, this picture of the church with the full armor of God is not just an individual portrait of the believer. This is the portrait of our community experience as a church. Supplicate with perseverance for all the saints, for all the saints. So that all the saints will have the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, the way it was played out, if you will, by Jesus Christ, the incarnate Word of God. And when Paul gives us this picture of praying or supplicating for one another, for all the saints, he goes on, verse 19, and he says, and for me... For me, for me, Paul, pray for me as well, supplicate for me that utterance, and you will not see that in your translation, but the word translated with utterance is actually logos. And the logos became flesh, the word, same word. That I will receive, Paul says, logos, that logos may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly. Freely, openly, plainly to make known the mystery of the gospel. And he goes one more step. For which I am ambassador, he says, in chains. We've seen that word before. When Paul said we are ambassadors of God and we are pleading with this world, please be reconciled to God. Ambassador in chain, yes, that in it, I may speak boldly, freely, openly, plainly, as I ought to speak. This is how I am supposed to speak, boldly. Pray for me as well. You know, I'm far for being, from being at the level of Paul's preaching, but I can resonate with him. This, this, this reality here is not an easy reality that he expresses in beautiful language. He's in prison. And he was sent in prison. He was taken in custody. Do you know why? Acts chapter 21, verse 28. Because some people, some Israelites, started crying out in the courtyard of the temple, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, the Torah. So he's accused of preaching against the law, the Torah, which is the Old Testament, and this place, which is a temple. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. That's what he's speaking about. I'm in prison because of this. 
please pray for me that I will still have the courage to take the sword of the Spirit and go out and wage peace in that raging war. Now, some of you have preached before, some of you are preaching throughout this week of prayer or 10 days of prayer. Preaching is no easy endeavor. Preaching, especially when you stumble upon passages that disturb you profoundly, can be a painful, consuming reality. When I started preaching, most of the time I would preach standalone sermons. Standalone in the sense that you have a topic, you deal with it in a sermon, then you have another topic, deal with it in a sermon. Or maybe series, a series on a specific topic, like a series on prayer, a series on forgiveness, a series on church, a series. And it went all well. I don't think it's a problem to preach like that. Only that a few years ago, like seven years ago, I had a moment of aha. I was reading this passage in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy 3.16. You all know this, right? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And this is the revelation I got at that time. I got to the realization that if I continue to preach standalone sermons or thematic or topical sermons, serious or standalone sermons, there will be topics in the Bible I will never preach about. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? And, and you may think, but why not? Very simple. There are topics in the Bible I don't like. In my humanness, there are words from God that are like, oh my goodness, is this in the Bible? Should I preach this? Should I live this? That's one thing. The other thing is, I know from experience that some others feel the same. Be honest and, and, and ask yourself whether you like everything in the Bible the same way. Mm. Pretty problematic. Because when, when the Word speaks about other people and you can use it as a club, it may be some sort of satisfaction. But when it's the sword of the Spirit, the sword of the Spirit penetrate, penetrates first your own heart. Does some, some cut there. And then goes forward. And uh, I even had the experience in some other churches that people came to me and told me, Pastor, don't touch on these topics here. That's real. These are hot potatoes. These are no-nos. Preach about this and this and this, and everybody will be happy, and we will love you to the end. There's only one problem. When you sign up at God's call to be a preacher, you cannot cherry pick. You cannot pick and choose. So for seven years now or so, almost every time I preach, I preach a series, but from the text of the Bible, going through the Bible text by text. And I'm telling you, it's a totally different ballgame because there's nothing I can skip. Sometimes, I'm telling you, I would skip it. I would skip it and, and go to something more beautiful. Speak about grace, about shalom in the way the world looks at it. Or some other times I would just take the truth 
and use it as a bludgeon? I'm being honest, open, because I believe we have to face God's Word and see how desperately we need what Paul says, prayer and supplication. If we don't have that kind of experience, we can pray, and then we can do all kind of things. We can pray and do whatever we want to do. This is what Ellen White says in Review and Herald, and that's 1888. Some of you know a little church history, and you know that after this time, she was kind of exiled to Australia. She says, the work of God for this time cannot be accomplished without arousing opposition, reproach, and calumny. Satan is at enmity with the truth, and he will instigate against its advocates every manner of warfare. Every manner of warfare. And then, she goes on, his efforts to overthrow the Word of God, the Word of God, will not be wholly confined to the ranks of its abode enemies. But among those who claim to believe and practice it, this is, this is extremely radical, among those who claim to believe and practice it, some shall depart from the faith. Wow. Our work is an aggressive one, and as faithful soldiers of Jesus, we must bear the blood-stained banner into the very stronghold of the enemy. If we will consent to lay down our arms to lower the blood-stained banner, to become the captives and servants of Satan, we will be released from the conflict and the suffering. You're good. You're good to go. And then, but this peace will be gained only at the loss of Christ and heaven. We cannot accept peace on such conditions. Let it be war, war to the end of earth's history, rather than peace through apostasy and sin. Brothers and sisters, I propose to you this. And if you see me preach from books of philosophy or some other sources, stop me, please. And if you hear me preach things that you've never heard before but are in the Bible, please take them as from the Lord. I cannot have a different approach on this. And for this, just like Paul said, I pray, I do the tefillah with the Lord and I supplicate. And I want to encourage you to do the same for all the saints. For yourself, but for all the saints. And as Paul said, and please pray for me as well. And if you feel like this message was for you as well. I would like to please, to invite you to please stand and move at least one step from where you are. Okay? Only if you, if you feel this is for you as well. If not, discard it. Throw it. But if, if it is for you as well, then please make one step, maybe forward, maybe to the side, if that's, that's, that's what you have a comfortable place for. I don't want to bring everybody down here, because probably no, no, not everybody would come, but still, we don't want to be 
too close to one another. But I would like us to reconsecrate ourselves. I know the risk of, the, of this, or some of the risks of this, but I'm committed in front of you, in front of heavens, in front of the word, to preach the word. Not pick and choose, not cherry pick, go and preach everything that is in there. Because that is the sword of the Spirit. Always grace and truth. Grace first and then truth. And if by any chance this sermon was more on the truth side, please forgive me and and take my words as, as a, a surplus of grace so we, we can balance it somehow out. Because, because, yes, even this sermon should have been more about grace than truth. Because if we are to err, we are to err on the side of grace rather than on the side of truth. Let us pray. Lord, your church, your people... We are standing in front of you because we want the full armor that you can provide. And in this raging war, we want to be waging your shalom, reconciling with you and then reconciling with one another. May your spirit move each one of us. And wherever you placed us, whether on this stage, at our workplace, in our families, in our neighborhoods, may each one of us preach the word, all the word. In Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit, amen.